Guess what this is? Good guess. Well, if it was from this angle, yes. But um, this is actually San Francisco Airport. So this cat is, this is a Steve Winter shot. This is a, a cat in Pacifica. Um, it's like in the last couple months. And we have cameras all over the Bay Area. But this is just a, a beautiful shot taken by a really great photographer. And I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to stand. I'm actually going to stand over here. Um, we do have mountain lions, yes. but. I'm, I'm here to tell you more about these cats and, and actually just shed some light that makes everyone a little more comfortable with what they do out there and why we should be less afraid. So we are here to talk about mountain lions. They are an apex predator. Encountering predators in the wild. These are all remote cameras in the Bay Area. And look at this guy. We do have bear. Just North Bay. Uh, this is a local shot, too. So this is a young kitten. Look at the mom, always close behind. And this cat stopped to look at our camera very briefly. Uh, I'm not telling you, but it's in the Bay Area. <laughs> Just know they're with us. This is Esperanza. Esperanza was the 24th cat of a Santa Cruz um, the Santa Cruz phase of the Bay Area Puma Project. And this is a direct quote from science uh, back in July. Humans have touched off the world's latest mass extinction, and the consequences are being felt on land and in water systems as large predators vanish. This is Esperanza when she was killed by a poacher. This is Esperanza when she was still alive as you watch her moving very delicately on the landscape. These cats are very wary. She won't even put her hind leg down. She's looking around to see if it's safe for her to eat. She stays there for actually quite a while before she starts to feed. And uh, this is really the way they move. And you're going to see more of this tonight. Again, the kittens. This is the family group. Mom with her three kittens now. Extinction begins long before the last of the species is gone. <coughs> Loss of large predators is actually humankind's most pervasive influence on the natural world. This is Highway 13. And this is F13. She was the 13th cat collared in the, the local study. And a woman proudly displayed her gun over this cat after she lured it back to kill it after it just fed on a hobby animal that was not protected. Let's just go global for a minute. Um, we know very little about less than 3% of the world's described species. 40%, more than 40% of jaguar habitat is lost. Over 93% of historic tiger habitat is lost. Looking at the lion, over 80% of its original habitat is lost. We think about wolves. We have a wolf entering back into California, over 65% of its original habitat is now lost. And the snow leopard, the ethereal snow leopard, over 20% of that habitat is also lost. This cat is very powerfully affected by climate change. The puma, which we are here to talk about tonight, over 40% of its original range is gone. Sebastian's in the room. This is his shot, photographer in the back. Felly Day is a six-year, six-and-a-half-year-old organization. We're here to advance the conservation of wild cats and their habitats worldwide through critical research, compelling education, cutting-edge technology, and conservation strategies must result. We're based in the Sausalito Headlands. This cat was rescued from under a car in Southern California with her sister starving to death. The mother had been killed. Cats stay with their mother close to two years for survival. She's now in captivity. Why do we look at cats? Why would we consider wild cats as part of a, a bigger picture? 37 wild cat species around the world, they are all in decline, threatened or endangered, except for domestic or feral cats, human issues. Besides being charismatic and mysterious, they are often indicator species of healthy ecosystems. 
mountain lion, bobcats, we need them. Common challenges, conflict with humans sits at the top of that list. That is growing. Habitat fragmentation is causing that. Loss of connectivity results. We'll talk more about this. Road kill, more cats are being killed trying to cross our roads. Loss of prey, disease and poisoning. This is a really nice shot just of ecosystem doing what it does. A bobcat and a coyote are sharing on this kill. A healthy ecosystem has lots of species diversity. It's essential for that ecosystem to thrive and be less damaged by other impacts, human interaction, natural disasters, and climate change. The lion plays a tremendous role in wilderness ecosystems. It sits at the absolute apex of the food chain. It is an indicator of the health of the ecosystem and helps maintain the stability of that system. Morris Hornacker was the first person to do a long-term a long study on mountain lions. This was his PhD back in the 60s. Still incredibly relevant quote today. This is our apex predator. Yeah, he's taking a yawn there, just you know, pretty bored with us right now, which they are generally overall. Regulating force. These guys preserve ecological integrity. We'll talk more about why. But the benefits to other species as an umbrella species, they have the greatest habitat size needs. They, they share their kills. The vulnerabilities of mountain lions are shared with a number of other species besides the fact that they're highly charismatic and they inspire excitement about conservation. So we can use them for educating and teaching and raising awareness about our ecosystems. This cat has more names than any other mammal. <laughs> it's actually got over 40 in English. It's in the Guinness Book of World Records. So this tells you how many stories follow this cat through North, Central, and South America. Lots of history there. So let's just talk a little bit about the range. The green areas on the map are its traditional range. And if we think about the Canadian Yukon to the tip of South America, think about the differing terrains and the, the adaptability this cat must, must be very good at. Sea level to 16, actually 17,000 feet uh, or more. And these cats really are able to navigate these incredibly different difficult terrains as they move. Native Americans offered it respect. The, uh, the vermin concept was brought in by European immigrants. And so the present day, it's been extirpated in the red areas on this map. And so if we think about the US, I mean, a big chunk of the US, this cat, yes, it's trying to move back east, but it's having a very, very difficult time. The puma was extinct in the eastern US by 1900. In California, by the 70s, we had less than 600 left in California. Uh, the Reagan administration was actually, um, was actually a driver for the moratorium at that time on killing mountain lions. And then Proposition 117 was passed in 1990. Current status, it's a specially protected mammal in California. However, 150 lions are killed each year, and this is a, a minimum number in California from depredation permits and roadkill, and we'll talk about uh, more about what depredation permits are. So let's just talk about this cat, and this is really how they live their lives, on the move. They don't roar. They're actually classified as a, a small cat. They are not in the pantheric family of cats. Um, Excellent sensory perception. So if you think about their need to be an ambush predator, they move on a landscape and they need to have all of the vision, olfactory, and hearing sensations highly sensitized so they can detect their prey and ambush it from behind. Uh, coat color varies geographically in the Bay Area. We're looking more at a tawny brown reddish color. It matches our terrain locally. If you go to South America, it's a, more of a silvery gray matching that terrain there. Females under 150 pounds, typically in the Bay Area, they're mostly under 100 pounds, um, maybe a little bit over. Males up to 260 pounds. We tend to see smaller pumas near the equator, larger near the poles. 
five to nine feet. So a cat, five to nine feet, think about the length. 40% of that is a big, long, thick, cylindrical tail. And that is a distinguishing characteristic of the puma with a dark tip, usually at the end. And uh, bobcats have the short little tail. We'll, we'll show you some more visuals. But the tail is used for balance and also for warming themselves in cold weather. The jumping, OK, these guys are amazing. OK, one leap, 18 feet. Can any of you guys jump 18 feet? I mean, think about it. Uh, if you think a fence is high enough to keep a mountain lion out, you have to think again. And horizontally, 20 to 30 feet in a leap. Powerful hind legs adapted for jumping to leap on the back of the prey and uh, take it down. 6,000 calories a day is typical for a three, four-year-old male. That is about a deer a week. So this is just a nice piece of footage of a cat, and you'll see the power in motion. He's running from dogs. This is in Chile, uh, but it gives you a sense of how amazing they are, just athletic prowess of these animals. This cat had eaten the night before, too, so he had a full belly. Pretty soon, you're going to see those dogs fall way behind. Is he going downhill? No, he's flat now. He's flat. Where are those dogs? <coughs> so they can do this for short distances. Right. <laughs> yep, quickly in pursuit. So um, a really nice shot of uh, this uh, cat's paw. So distinguishing again, if you're out and you think you want to detect tracks, three lobes at the bottom are very um, distinguishing. And if you see this pad, if there are claws, usually cats, their claws are retractable. So you're not going to see those claws in a track of a cat. You're, it's usually going to be a, a coyote or a dog. And what you're going to see is just a pad, and actually these four, with uh, three lobes at the bottom. So five retractable claws on the front paws. One's a dew claw, just like your house cat. So what do these guys eat? Obligate carnivores. They need meat to survive. This is a cat taking down a deer up in North Bay on our camera, which is pretty rare to get. They're generalist predators. Mouse to moose, they'll eat everything in between. However, deer make up most of that diet. And we have plenty of deer in the Bay Area, so um, these cats have plenty of food. They will also even take out uh, bobcats and coyotes, and people are often f surprised to hear that. Oh, not humans. We're getting there. Stalk, sprint, and ambush. So the cat in the tree leaps onto the back of the prey, bites the back of the neck, usually severing the spinal column. It's a very quick death for that prey. This is a young cat actually testing its skills out on a fawn. And You'll see him afterwards. But this cat's under a year old. So you know, the, the interesting thing is they learn with their mother. And they spend two years with their mother learning how to take down the right prey. And we'll talk about when that's jeopardized. This is a cat actually caching. So when we, when we talk about caching prey, they will feed on the deer kill for a while. You see this is a buck. And uh, to protect the food and their meal, They'll cover it so that it stays fresh, and they keep other predators from it. And they'll come back and feed, or they may lie close by. But this cat is just um, you know, very carefully covering it up, wants to come back and feed on it. They may feed on it over two or three days and then <coughs> move on. But if you actually come across one of these on a trail, uh, chances are you'll scare that cat off, and he won't come back and feed. So you're going to make him go. And if you go up to it and mess with it, 
he'll have to go make another kill. So try to avoid messing with um, kills if you see them. This is a cache deer, and actually, um, as you can see, they, they aren't affected by poison oak as we are. So the cat's like caching it with poison oak to keep humans off of it, maybe. So social behaviors. These guys, um, they, they communicate a lot with each other. And this territory marking, this is a scrape. So he's taking his two hind legs and rubbing them in the ground and urinating in that. And this other one up at the top of the screen is he's rubbing on something. So they'll deposit their scent. And these are a couple of the ways they communicate with each other in their territory. They're very territorial cats. And I got some vocalizations for you. So that's a sort of, that's a cat growling. You got a kitten chirping to its mom there. This is very common. Back and forth they'll talk. And the next one is a little eerie, so this is cut short. But females in heat. They're in heat for about five or six days, and that's when she's signaling to the male that she's ready to mate, and that's that screeching you hear. When they hook up, they uh, will spend a couple days to, together, male and female, mating. And if she's pregnant, her gestation is around three months. And at that time, she'll <coughs> seek out a den site. Um, cats start reproducing in about two years. And then every two or three years after that, if reproduction rates are normal. Kittens. Litters of one to six. And uh, typically two to four is more common. They're born densely spotted, blind when they're born, with these uh, amazing eyes, these blue cobalt eyes that they carry until six months to a year. <laughs> this is about five weeks old, this kitten. <laughs> he's, he's pretty pissed. <laughs> so you see how fierce they are, even at that size. So um, he's out of the den, and that's why he's upset. It's dark and, and safe in there, and mom's going to come back. So what we do is take them out, we tag them, we put them back in, and everything's fine. But, you know, they're really feisty, so you see how tough they are even at that age. They're eating meat at six weeks, and they're still nursing up to three or four months. And they're about the size of a large bobcat at around six months. They... Um, the spots, you'll see evidence of the spots even up to a year. They'll be faded, but you'll still see evidence of them. But the, the tough thing for the female is that during the time she's raising these young, she's got to provide two to three times normal to those cubs. So she's got to take down more deer, a lot of pressure on the mother. So Cub survival and tracking, we've got tags. We put these little collars on to understand the first year of life. It's really essential as they are having more difficulty dispersing to understand the challenges these young cats have. And um, these, season or all year, year round for mountain lions. Um, you know, typically you'll see um, more of the mating in the, the sort of spring and you'll get you know, cubs throughout the summer into the fall, et cetera. But it's, it's year-round for mountain lions. Um, these are about three-month-old cubs, and sometimes we will... We can't put collars on cubs past this age because they need to be drugged, and so when we anesthetize them, they have to be a bit older, and the collars need to fit to a growing neck. So we'll usually wait till they're closer to their adult size to put the full collars on. The cats are native to the Americas, so these guys have the largest geographical range of any terrestrial mammal except for humans, us. Um, they persist in very low densities, so when we have a mountain lion that's killed, it has impact on the population in that ecosystem. So if we think about home range sizes, a female Typical mountain lion female's average home range is 50 square miles. Contiguous land. So if you think about what that need is, and this is just a nice shot of this cat relaxing. I mean, this is very unusual footage. So she's going to start to make some vocalizations we didn't get on the sound yet, but um, it's just nice to see these cats sort of relax like this. 
Kind of like a house cat, right? Yeah. Um, so locally, though, what we're seeing in the Bay Area, because we are an urban setting, so we've got urban carnivores, per se. Uh, females, 25 to 40 square miles is what we're seeing. How much can we squeeze those habitats is really the question with more of our urbanization. Male home range, anywhere from 100 to 200 to 300, 400 square miles. These cats just move their entire lives. The males just keep going. And so it's really important that for their healthy survival, they have this contiguous habitat. Females will overlap um, their home ranges, females and males. So a common scenario is a female or two or three overlapping into a male's territory. Males are not tolerant of each other and usually will fight to uh, protect their territory. So that could be to the death. And so the problems exist when a young male is trying to disperse is forced back in and gets into it with the resident male and is likely killed. Um, these cats are very solitary. They spend their lives alone. Except when mating, as I showed you, uh, to a female and male moving together, or females with cubs, and uh, possibly siblings dispersing together sometimes, spend a couple days together. Females are pregnant or raising young almost three quarters of their lives. So if a female is killed, think about the cub I showed at the beginning. There are cubs that are left that cannot survive in the wild. So a lot of cubs are dying because females are being killed for whatever reason, and the cubs need to, they're very dependent on the mother for close to two years. Lifespan in the wild, six to 13 years. Yeah. Uh, when parks are restricted to human like activities? There are very few mountain lions here. That's what I'm trying to, I'm getting to this point now, but yeah, it's a great question. And we do have very few mountain lions. And so I'm just going to tell you, we have close to, we have a bunch of cameras out in East Bay. Uh, lions are hard to find in Oakland, Berkeley. So um, we're seeing cats south of 580, and the occasional cat will come west or north. There are not resident cats in the urban setting that we know of yet. We hear of a lot of sightings, but our cameras aren't picking them up. So I'm, uh, you guys really need to hear this, because people really think there are cats where there aren't. And I gave a talk yesterday in Marin, and all these people want to know, where are the cats in Marin? We've got no cats in the headlands. People, for some reason, are thinking there are mountain lions everywhere. There are not. And I'll tell you more that will support this, just to, to give you more comfort about the fact that when you go out here, there's, there aren't like cats sitting there watching you waiting to pounce. <laughs> OK? We'll, we'll, we'll talk more. But this is up in the Sierras. This is a family group. So you can see the young kitten and mom up here in the front leading the way. What is the future for this cat in California? Keystone species are in decline. Trust me, this cat will never go on the endangered species list. It will go extinct first. People think there are these cats everywhere. They are not. Impact of fragmented habitat. This is huge, tremendous for these animals. Loss of their natural movement pathways. They must connect their populations. If you think about a mountain lion needing to go from Santa Cruz Mountains to Diablo, to Hamilton, to Gavilan, it's, this is what they do. They want to be in the remote mountainous regions with a, lots of trees, foliage, and deer, and water. Genetic diversity is impacted if they can't move. A big other impact affecting these animals is poisons, our anticoagulant rodenticides. I'll tell you a little bit more about that, but that's affecting all wildlife, mountain lions, bobcats as well unhealthy ecosystems, and then conflict with all of us rises because this is a predator. It's like scary, right? Well, let's just correct all these assumptions. These are, you know, California, traditionally California carnivores. If we have wolves back, we'll be very lucky because wolves take the pressure off mountain lions. It's like we need a combination of apex predators in the system that all take, keep the deer, the, the prey species at this manageable level for disease and otherwise. 
So let's just talk about problems with fragmented habitats. Here's a natal den. The mom gives birth. Eventually, these juveniles need to disperse. So they have to. It's a natural thing these carnivores do. They must move outward. So the cost of removing these apex predators for us is tremendous. Deer populations increase rapidly. Disease in the system increases. Lyme disease will go up. And these guys keep, they, what they do is they remove weakened and diseased prey naturally. So what they're, they're keeping a robo robust ecosystem intact. Unchecked grazing by deer leads to all of the ground cover being eaten down to the core. So it's removing habitat for a number of other species. We need these predators on the landscape for this. So if you think about a system with wolves and pumas, they're keystone species. They control the prey populations from growing beyond this carrying capacity. So if you take them out, the effects cascade all the way down to the grasses. And this is just an illustration that shows it. This is a barren landscape with no predators. This is a landscape once the predators have been restored. Quite a different view. Looking at the poison super quickly, predators feed on rodents. We need predators. When we start controlling rodent populations by using all the poisons, we're killing the predators as well. So here are the poisons. It's killing all these small mammals. Secondary exposure is going up to our bobcats, our coyotes, and then the mountain lion is getting tertiary exposure as well as the raptors. So all of these wildlife species, or non-target species, are being affected by these poisons. Puma deaths in California, just listed by uh, in order that we know of, depredation, whoops. Um, well, I'll just go through them, because the list, I was going to move to this anyway. If your pet or livestock is killed by a mountain lion, you can call Fish and Game, and you can say, I want a permit issued to kill the mountain lion. So that means if you leave your dog out or your cat at night or you don't protect your livestock and the mountain lion moves by, they're opportunists, they're just trying to survive and they kill it and eat it, then you can kill the lion. But you don't even know if it's a lion most of the time. So there's a lot of problems with this law. We are uh, pushing out a lot of education to ranchers and communities to teach them about how to avoid deaths on all sides which we must do. Um, there are guard dog species that protect wildlife very effectively. And um, this will keep them from being take, taken by bobcats, coyotes, wolves, and mountain lions. Mountain lions are, are blamed for a number of uh, kills they actually don't ever have anything to do with. Barriers to natural movement. So if we think about really nice habitats, which you guys have up here, um, this is uh, Highway 17's a death trap for humans as well. But mountain lions are being killed in great numbers along with other species on this roadway. This is a culvert underneath. These cats actually, cats live on both sides of this. So they just need to get across. And there's a very uh, difficult half mile area on 17 where cats are killed more frequently, but they won't go through. Right. Be a gap under them. I know, it's getting worse. Them, well, I see so many dead I on there and right. All the time. Right. No, you're absolutely right. The, uh, so the concept is we're working with Caltrans to widen these culverts. And I've got some really nice examples of effective over and underpasses for wildlife. We need them for all of our species in urban settings. We've got our roadways just growing massively, and we're seeing a lot more of this. So good example here, six months GPS data of one cat. Um, this is Highway Freeway 91, and this is Irvine Regional Park. This is Southern California Highway here, residential area to the right. Over six months, the cat never goes inside here, has no interest in the residential area. But can't get over this freeway either. Gets over here a couple times, but it's boxed in. This is a very awful scenario for one of these animals that needs 
a, a wide range of habitat. Some of the solutions for culverts, these are two cats moving under a really nice culvert in Montana. And it's effective. This is in Banff, one of the overpasses. This is actually in Washington. And this is in Utah. So the solutions are effective. And this is actually a first elephant underpass in Kenya, which is pretty cool. Very effective. So something to remember is dispersing mountain lions are at higher risk of death. Most of the time, you guys hear of the Berkeley, the Redwood City, any of these cats that are seen or come into town, it's most often a two-year-old male trying to disperse to establish his new home range. And most likely just you know, ending up in the wrong place at the wrong time, these cats are just simply trying to move on. So our plans in working with different development groups is to allow passageway through. When they have passageway through, they don't want to stop anywhere. They just keep going. Um, they have no interest in our towns. And so human wildlife conflict is, is a tough one in urban settings because a cat comes into Santa Monica here and what are you going to do? It's in a building. I mean, the, the guy's petrified, scared to death of all these humans surrounding him. Pumas in public consciousness. Cultural values are the key driver here. So what is the difference between the biological carrying capacity and the social carrying capacity? It's about our tolerance for a predator we may know we need, but how do we sort of settle with the fear of this thing? And well, it's educating, educating ourselves about what it's doing. They really do remind us we're part of nature. I mean, we are enriched where these big predators are present. So the Bay Area Puma Project was uh, started back in 2008. The Santa Cruz Puma Project is tracking a number of cats down in Santa Cruz now. East Bay is underway. We've got cameras out in East Bay, and a, a collaring study is uh, in the works. So we will be collaring cats in East Bay, and we will know um, much more clearly what's going on in Oakland and Berkeley Hills in the coming year. And so stay tuned for that. North Bay is also underway. That will start in, in uh, 2014. We've got camera arrays up in North Bay as well. So what we'll do is we'll do this sort of invent invasive monitoring, which is some collaring, which is really important for us to understand with data where cats are going up to a freeway. And they'll, they'll get stuck there for a couple days. They'll come back in. They're, they're sort of navigating this challenge in an urban setting. We will also use our camera arrays, hair snares, and scat analyses. So we're going to do a full genetic analysis of what's actually happening with the genetic, the lineages of these cats. And it's really important to understand how we can help their populations thrive amongst us going forward. So these are all the things we're looking at here. This is just a look at one of the collars, GPS accelerometer collars. So we can actually uh, overlay a, a number of different data pieces that uh, tell us a, a more detailed story. Capture methods, we'll use hounds to treat the cats. So dogs, cats, they do not get along. So these dogs chase the cats. And you know, I, you guys may have heard stories of people who have a dog, and all of a sudden there's a cat treat. And it's like, wow, how did that happen? Cats do not like any dogs, but um, it's also something I am careful to say. Don't feel like you have an absolute uh, safety if you have a dog with you, and nothing's ever going to happen. So we'll chase them up the tree. We anesthetize the cats in the tree. We give them a dissociative and a sedative. They will uh, be under for 45 minutes or so. This is uh, Etta. She was the first female cat collared in the in the study downside, she's upset because the dogs are barking underneath. That's why she's got that mean, angry look on her face. So we'll work them up for 35, 40 minutes. And um, in the Bay Area, typically, we won't give them an antidote. We won't pull them out of the drug super fast. But if there's another predator on the landscape, uh, we will do that because it's unsafe for them being groggy. It's kind of like you being drunk and staggering around and, and not being safe somewhere. So. They'll come out of this uh, slowly, and we'll just wait for them as they move um, into their, back into their natural setting with a big, chunky collar on, of course. 
They wear those for about a year, and then they automatically drop off. So we get powerful data. Uh, every two, four hours, we'll pull data on those movements. So there's a look at the collar. Some early data from uh, Santa Cruz just to illustrate female and male home range. The circles are the females and the squares are the males. So if you see the overlapping females and the males here that make these long jaunts downward. So it just illustrates the difference and the different way these cats really move around. Um, this is just a, an analysis that Chris did that was predicting where the cats would, would be most likely to cross. And there were a couple of cats going back and forth on Highway 17 eventually. In the first year of the study, no one was crossing on our collared cats. But um, a num two cats have been hit in this one section. One killed, one survived. And the one killed was a female who was a day away from giving cubs. Um, yeah, giving birth. So stories uh, really relevant to the Bay Area because, um, again, lots of people moving around in urban nests. One thing is they're very well traveled. So a cat left the south rim of the Grand Canyon uh, one evening. This was a, a National Park Service study over two years and um, traveled across the entire bottom and uh, traversed the raging Colorado River and got to the tip of the North Rim at 5 a.m. the next morning. So if you guys have been to the Grand Canyon, that's a lot of land to cover. This is Eric. Is, um, he's hanging with this cat as he's coming out of sedation, and he's worried that the cat will make a left turn and fall into the canyon. So he's trying to coax him to the right. Um, so surprisingly close to humans, two years of data, Grand Canyon tourist trails, cats living, sleeping, uh, within 20 meters of these trails, GPS collared cats, no one ever saw a cat. Not once, two years. So they don't want to know us or see us. Santa Monica Mountains, this is more relevant to Santa Cruz in the local area. This cat's only upset. If you see the snare here, he cannot run away. He wants to run away. There's a dart. We're, we're advancing towards this cat. He would take off in the other direction, so he's trying to be fierce to keep us back. So that's why the uh, angry face. But Santa Monica Mountains, 30 years ago, 50 cats in the Santa Monica Mountains. Today, there are all of five or so they're tracking, give or take a couple cats. But it's essentially a local extinction underway. And this is a highly urbanized area. Cats are hit on the freeways in Southern California very frequently. They're also making incredible crossings. So there are ways we can enable these cats to, th to thrive. It just requires us being very thoughtful. Um, some of our remote camera images are just picking up some really nice. Um, so just to give you a, an idea, this is really, we use a lot of these to um, build data on presence and just population sensing before collaring. This is a cat caching. Prey, very common. She's feeding and her cub just wants to play with the tail. <laughs> Two cubs will uh, roll out of the bushes here. They're playing hide and seek. It's just, you know, very playful the cubs are. And then this cat again, you saw this is rubbing. So, you know, basically just moving these guys. Whoops, let's go back there. Um, this is another Steve Winter shot, and this is actually in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. But you can see the, the cub just looking up to mom for, what are we doing next? Tell me where to go. Um, this is a population density look at San Francisco Bay Area region. A conservation initiative underway with a number of partners where we have this huge study area in the East Bay. And we will be, as I said, undertaking this long-term wildlife monitoring which will look at bobcats, mountain lions. Um, in the East Bay, we'll look at deer and wild boar. Um, so we look at the predator and the prey, because they move in sync. And mountain lions care about deer and water, not humans. Genetic analysis from Harris. Sorry? We are not. Um, I think it's important, actually, for 
studies to be done on coyotes in the Bay Area. Um, so yes, I think that is important. We just we don't have the resources. Um, I welcome people do. I know people that are interested in that, but it would help to make bring the picture into a more fine-grained clarity. So this is just an interesting stat from Marin County. In 85, there were 148 reports of mountain lion sightings. Well, the Fish and Game at that time didn't consider mountain lions to exist in Marin County, so they were admitted from their um, California range map. Well, these two guys <laughs> were funded for five days of track surveys, and they found a mother and kitten tracks on Corte Madera Ridge. So we really want to make sure we're doing some very good analysis and learning the truth, because in Marin, for a long time, Fish and Gabe said, there are no mountain lions in Marin. Well, they do exist. There aren't many, but they're, and they're more sort of north on Mount Tam and towards the coast, but we still have them. So this was just an interesting uh, piece of data. And this is an East Bay cat. This was actually down in the Sunil area just recently. So education, um, this is key. We have a, a powerful education program, Cat Aware, in the K-14 school program. It's funded by um, Packard, Nat Geo, Disney, and some private donors. We'll reach 10,000 kids by 2013. We have this really nice set of modules, presentations, curriculum, designs for the teachers, a predator-prey lab that teaches the interactions between predator and prey and the natural flow and cycles of predator-prey relationships. And um, field visits with the biologists, hikes in nature, get those kids outside because once they're out there, amazing things happen. I mean, the kids just love to be outside. So this is a, the, the lab, kids working on the lab and they just really get into it. They're helping us set up some remote cameras as well, so we'll make that a part of our, our work with them. Um, interactive website, Bay Area Puma Project, check it out. It's more data is being added to this, and we'll have an interactive map where um, we're gonna have actually live news feeds to that map that you can also report sightings to as well. Um, Puma Wild's an educational game, so this is going to be available on your phones, your computers. You become a cat moving on the landscape, trying to survive. So actually, at the, at the easiest level, which I haven't managed to succeed at yet, um, <laughs> you will take down deer and you survive another week. So every time you take down a deer, your, your health goes up, and every layer of difficulty, more human encroachment. So buildings, hunters, cars, roadways, and it's harder for you to survive. So it's going to be a really cool, fun, challenging game. Um, tracking series we've got underway in Marin County, which um, we will bring to East Bay. But if you guys want to make the trek, it's a great tracking series with these two expert trackers. And um, it's a lot, of, a lot of fun. California license plate, you can sign up for this. We're trying to get to 7,500 signatures. This will bring uh, really important funding to California. There's zero funding in California for mountain lion research today. So everything we pull in for research is a lot of work. And there's zero federal or state funding for this. So you can go sign up if you're interested in having that cat face on your car. Let's talk about attacks. Fear of attack. <laughs> This guy's going to attack you. There has been no mountain lion attack in the Bay Area in over 100 years. Okay? These guys, we're not on their menu. So actually, and I, that skipped over that super fast, but if you, I'll go back just so you can read that again, because, because dog bites, lightning strikes, rattlesnake bites, a number of things are killing people every year. So 16 deaths a year from dog bites. I mean, think about our minds. It is the predator that captures our imagination. So deer, bees, goats, even jellyfish account for more human fatalities than mountain lions. For every person killed by a lion, 1,200 are struck by lightning, and 1,100 are killed by hunting accidents. Q 
keep it in mind. It is, I mean, it's okay for us to, to sort of have this fear, but keep it healthy. No one has been attacked in over 100 years. In 1909, a mother and her daughter were attacked, and the mountain lion was rabid. They both died of rabies, not from the, from the attack. It's a sick lion. There's something seriously wrong when a, when a lion attacks a human being. 85 to 90 percent of all sightings in the Bay Area are not mountain lions. Keep that in mind. So they're usually dogs, deer, coyotes, house cats. So I tell the story of the Hayward incident. You can look it up online. A number of resources were deployed for this scary mountain lion that was running around Hayward a couple years ago. And uh, helicopters, police. Two or three days later, they cornered the cat. It was a big house cat. Yeah. So just keep it in mind. It's like really important, really important. So living in Puma habitat. Deer are near. Trim vegetation around your house. If you guys live around these parts, don't leave pets or pet food out at night. These are opportunists. Cats are just trying to survive. They, if they come across a dog or a cat and they haven't been able to find a deer, which is actually highly unlikely, they may take the dog or cat. Fence your livestock and keep it contained. Um, this is something that's really important to keep the depredation permits from happening. So recreating in Puma habitat, uh, you know, you guys have to use your judgment, but avoid hiking, biking, running alone. I would say during uh, the hours of their highest activity levels, dusk to dawn, these cats are moving. They usually bed down somewhere during the day and sleep. During the night, they're, you know, scoping out their prey um, and the deer are plentiful. But if you want to hike or run at dusk or later, go with somebody else. And you know, I've I've done um, field work for years, and we I've been out with one other person and a couple other people. Cats have never come after us. We've handled kittens in front of them. Mothers growl in the bushes. They've never come after us. They run the other way. So they really don't want to. Um, interact with us. Never approach a cat of any size. So if you see a kitten, the woman who was um, attacked up in Placerville, she came, became, came between a mother and her kitten. So this is when you might run into trouble. Stay away from the cats. Stay away from the carcasses. You, you're more likely to drive the cat away and force it to take down another meal. It's not probably not going to attack you over a deer kill. but you, you will cause it to, to do more work. Make noise is kind of silly because they know you're there. <laughs> they see us long before we would ever know or see them. So, um, you know, enjoy and recreate. And don't have fear, but be sensible about recreating between these hours. If you were to encounter a cat, what do you do? Maintain eye contact. You've got to challenge that cat back. And you know we can all say this, but think about it. You're not going to do what you do with a bear. You're not going to curl up and, and pr play dead. Um, you want to be as big as possible. So if you have backpacks or water bottles, you're going to throw. And this is only if the cat starts to advance or is really threatening. Most of the sightings that are real sightings that I hear about are a tail. They're gone. And I mean, they don't want to see you. It's really true. So if you really do have a sort of aggravated cat and it's kind of looking at you and it starts to come towards you, you can throw whatever you got. You got to fight back. So again, Mendocino, the woman fought the cat off, saved her husband's life. If there's always a chance something can happen, but the cat is usually there's something wrong. So when a mother is killed and there are young cats, so one of the reasons I talk to people about hunting not being a good thing for these populations is that it disrupts the population. The stable animals, if you remove them, because hunters will, will track them down and kill them, you've got like the teenagers running town. And young cats have not learned the full ropes. They haven't honed their skills um, on the landscape yet. So if the mother's killed and they're really young, yeah, uh, that young cat may end up going after a human. They don't know yet. So this is why California is very good that we don't hunt. 
but we also need to be responsible and prevent deaths to cats that are unnecessary because we need the moms raising the young so they go out and do the right thing. Um, that said, remember, no attacks in the Bay Area in over 100 years, so we're doing pretty well um, with all of this. So this, this cat is actually trying to be invisible. I know that he looks pretty big there, but see those ears down? They're not back, they're just down. Cats that bring their ears down, they'll do this a lot to, uh, in tall grass. They're trying to just, they want to disappear. They actually wish you would disappear, but he's not threatening there. The cat here is threatening. So he's pissed <laughs> off. So if you see that look, you might, you might kind of start throwing stuff if you got a backpack or something. Or you just kind of wait if he starts to come for, forward. But this guy is just upset because he's stuck. So difference between a bobcat and a mountain lion, important to remember. Little short tail, very different body cavity. She's got her cub with her. And you look at the mountain lion cub compared to the bobcat, still very different body shape. Long tail on that cub. And this is the sister. Actually, this is one of the kittens that was rescued. The mountain lion works a strong magic in the imagination of many Americans. It is the ultimate loner, a renegade presence in the wildest canyons and wildest mountains, the sign of everything that is remote from us, everything we have not spoiled. So this is straight from David Schuler, who said it very nicely. Um, just look at those eyes. Pretty amazing, huh? This is her sister. So she was the feisty one who was fierce. As you can tell, she's got that little stance, like, I'm a tough one. Stay back from me. And then the tongue sticks out, and you can't, you know, it's like, oh. <laughs> but I have a, a music video that I would ask you guys if you want to see it. It's not out for the public yet. It's five minutes. If you want to see it. It's, it's going to move fast, and the messaging's fast, but I think you'll enjoy it. So I'll just go straight to that. Give us your thoughts. 